All right, today we're gonna to be talking about vitamin B12 deficiency. And vitamin B12 is really a vitamin that's found in meats and in dairy product. So patients who are strict vegetarians, strict vegans, might develop B12 deficiency. But you can't assume that this is gonna happen because it really takes years for this to happen. Really, the body can store up to 5,000 micrograms of B12, half of which is gonna be in the liver, but we only need a daily intake of six to nine micrograms a day. This means that these patients have to go on a strict vegan diet for up to five years to really start developing B12 deficiency. Now B12 deficiency can present with either symptoms or they can present asymptomatically. So today we're gonna to be talking about the different presentations, how to work patients up and how to treat vitamin B12 deficiency. Now when discussing the etiology of vitamin B12 deficiency, really what's most talked about is gonna be pernicious anemia, which is an autoimmune disorder. But aside from that, other things can cause vitamin B12 deficiency as well. Things like gastritis, gastrectomy, HIV infection, medication side effects, inadequate intake, alcoholism. These are all things that can really prevent the absorption of vitamin B12. Now, when dealing with pernicious anemia specifically, we're gonna be looking at antibodies. These antibodies are gonna be directed towards the gastric parietal cells, which are gonna occur in about 90% of patients and or intrinsic factor. And intrinsic factor is a really specific antibody for pernicious anemia. It's uh, estimated that up to 90% or it's 90% specific in diagnosing pernicious anemia. Now, when talking about intrinsic factor, this works in two ways. The antibodies either block the B12 to the intrinsic factor, so that complex never forms in the first place, or the vitamin B12 and the intrinsic factor do form, but it's gonna prevent this complex from being absorbed into the ileal receptors. Either way, the outcome's the same, and the antibodies prevent the proper absorption of vitamin B12, so we have autoimmune destruction here in pernicious anemia. Now, talking about gastritis and gastrectomy, in both of these conditions, we're gonna have decreased levels of gastric acid, decreased levels of pepsin, and we're also gonna have atrophy of the gastric mucosa. All of this is gonna prevent the proper absorption of vitamin B12. There's also a possible link between H. pylori and low vitamin B12 levels. So possibly curing or treating H. pylori might fix this problem. Now, B12 deficiency or low levels of B12 are also very commonly seen in the elderly population, especially over the age of 65. And this possibly, again, has to do with the atrophy of the gastric mucosa. So a lot of times people screen for vitamin B12 deficiency, even if patients don't necessarily complain of symptoms because we wanna prevent the progression of B12 deficiency. Now, pernicious anemia specifically is gonna be most common in 40 to 70 year old patients, but it can definitely still occur in under 30 years of age. As we get older, over 65, we have B12 deficiency, but not necessarily from autoimmune destruction. Now, lastly, we have to look at medication side effects. Things like cimetidine, PPIs, and metformin are all gonna be common causes of vitamin B12 deficiency. Now, with the metformin itself, this can easily be corrected by simply giving calcium supplementation. Now we have to be careful because metformin is typically gonna be used for the treatment of type two diabetes. Diabetics are often gonna experience paresthesias, neuropathy, and patients with B12 deficiency are also gonna have these same symptoms. So we can't necessarily just attribute the neuropathy to the diabetes. We have to look at the metformin because this does occur fairly frequently. So we have to check for B12 deficiency in these patients and give calcium supplementation Jumping into the clinical manifestations of B12 deficiency. Now, weight loss, which is gonna be about 10 to 15 pounds, and a smooth tongue because we have loss of the papillae is gonna be seen in up to half of all patients. Classically, this tongue is gonna be beefy red, it's gonna be painful, and we might even experience a loss or a change in taste sensation. Now, neurological symptoms are really gonna be the hallmark symptom here of B12 deficiency. We're gonna have things like paresthesias, weakness, loss of dexterity, personality changes, dementia, and dementia is actually gonna be very curable with B12 deficiency. So for the most part, when you're working up a patient with dementia, this is also included in the initial screening, B12 deficiency. All right, now when dealing with the neuropathy specifically, it's for the most part gonna be symmetrical and it's gonna affect the lower extremities more so than the upper extremities. Now the paresthesia and the ataxia with loss of position and vibratory sense is really gonna be initially seen upon presentation. But really any neurological finding can occur in B12 deficiency with paresthesias being the most common. 
Also, you need to be on the lookout for a patient that has a new onset or a new loss of mental capabilities because oftentimes this can be attributed to B12 deficiency. Now, these signs of neuropathy really occur because we have a myelin degeneration and loss of nerve fibers of the dorsal and the posterior spinal cord. All right, now when it comes to the physical exam, we're gonna be looking at either the Romberg test or we can look at the Lermite sign. Now, the Romberg test, we're really gonna have the patient stand still, close their eyes, and if you start to notice them lose their balance because they have this loss of position sense, this is gonna be termed a positive Romberg sign. Now, Lermite sign is when we have these electric shocks that go from the neck all the way down to the feet when we have the patient flex their neck. So positive Lermite sign can be seen in B12 deficiency. Positive Romberg sign can also be seen in B12 deficiency. Now, copper deficiency. Copper deficiency can present exactly or identical to B12 deficiency, so we have to keep this on the differential. These patients are also gonna be at increased risk for osteoporosis. They're gonna be at increased risk for uh, fractures because of this. So that's also something we have to do these routine screening for the DEXA scan, especially in patients that are above 60, 65 years of age. Now, B12 deficiency can present with anemia and all anemia is gonna present with the same core symptoms. It doesn't matter what the anemia is from, we get these symptoms because we have decreased oxygenation to tissues. So core symptoms are gonna be palpitations because there's not enough oxygen going to the heart. We can have dyspion exertion because we don't have enough oxygen going to the lungs. And finally, we can have fatigue because we don't have enough oxygen going to the musculature. All right, so let's get into the laboratory findings that are gonna be seen in B12 deficiency to help support this diagnosis. Now, classically, we're gonna be seeing hypersegmented neutrophils and we're gonna be seeing macrocytosis on the peripheral smear. Macrocytosis means we have an MCV of over 100. Now we're also going to be looking at an increased indirect bilirubin, increased LDH, and increased iron levels. We're going to have a decreased haptoglobin. When looking at the reticulocyte count, we're either going to have a normal or we're going to have a low reticulocyte count. Now it's very important to note that we do not need anemia to diagnose B12 deficiency. I know this was something that I struggled with when I was in school and even shortly after school because I assumed that if we did not have anemia, then we cannot have B12 deficiency. And that's not the case. Anemia commonly occurs in B12 deficiency, but you don't need it and it doesn't exclude the diagnosis. So you can screen for B12 deficiency with a CBC. If you suspect, you have to order the B12 level. So if we have hypersegmented neutrophils, Without anemia, this should point you to the diagnosis of B12 deficiency. You also have to keep in mind that hypersegmented neutrophils can also occur in iron deficiency, so it's not specific to the disease by any means. So a normal hemoglobin, a normal hematocrit can also be seen in vitamin B12 deficiency. Now, lastly, we're also gonna be looking at homocysteine levels. Homocysteine is gonna be elevated in B12 deficiency. It can also be elevated in folic acid deficiency. They both have increased homocysteine levels. Now, one last thing about the MCV. Classically, we have macrocytosis. So ma classically, we have an elevated MCV over 100. We can also have a normal MCV, and even occasionally, we can have a low MCV. All right, so let's get into the actual diagnosis now. Now, the diagnosis of B12 deficiency is really gonna fall on B12 serum levels. The problem with this is that there's no gold standard as far as a reference range because different laboratories do different methods of collecting and they have different normal reference ranges. So for the most part, if we have a mid to high level of B12, we can safely assume that we have a normal B12. But if we have a low normal, this is where things can be a little bit tricky and we can get a little misguided here. So if this is the case, we have to look at other things. We also have to note that B12 can be lowered in pregnancy and it can be lowered in patients that take oral contraceptive pills but this does not mean that we have a deficiency here also if we have high level antibodies towards intrinsic factor this can lead to falsely elevated levels of b12 deficiency so we can definitely have pernicious anemia with elevated levels of b12 because this is a laboratory error because of how high the intrinsic factor antibodies are so if we suspect pernicious anemia we have to order b12 levels but it's also wise to order the intrinsic factor antibody to make sure we don't have that issue as well now again if we're unsure of this diagnosis of b12 deficiency then we have to rely on other measures here we're going to look for homocysteine and we're going to look at methylmalonic acid 
Now, methylmalonic acid is going to be elevated in B12. Homocysteine is going to be elevated in B12 deficiency. Homocysteine, like I said, can also be elevated in folic acid deficiency. So we have to make sure that we get the correct diagnosis. Methylmalonic acid will not be elevated in, in a folic acid deficiency. And this is the differentiator here, methylmalonic acid. So if we're unsure because we have a normal or we have a low normal B12 level, order the MMA, order the, full, the, the homocysteine, I should say, to confirm the diagnosis. Again, if we're concerned with pernicious anemia, order the intrinsic factor antibodies, and we also have to order antibodies towards parietal cells. Lastly, we want to look at elevated gastrin levels, and we're going to look for low pepsinogen 1 levels. These are all things that are going to help support this diagnosis of B12 deficiency. But it's very important that we're actually diagnosing B12 because if we for some reason mistake this as a diagnosis for folic acid deficiency and we start to give folic acid and we don't give proper supplementation for B12, then we're going to have worsening neurological symptoms even though the laboratory testing or the laboratory results are going to get better. So make sure we have the correct diagnosis. Now let's move on to the treatment of B12 deficiency. All right, let's get into the treatment of B12 deficiency. Now, B12 deficiency is for the most part gonna be treated with IM injection of B12. We're gonna be giving 1,000 micrograms every single day for one week, followed by 1,000 micrograms every single week for four weeks. Afterwards, if we notice that the cause or the reason for having B12 deficiency is irreversible, then we have to continue giving these injections every single month for the remainder of the patient's life. This is IM therapy, parental therapy. We also have another option here in giving the patient oral therapy, oral B12, and we can do this on a daily basis, orally of 1,000 to 2,000 micrograms every single day. It's just as effective as parental therapy, but the problem is, and this even holds true if the patients lack intrinsic factor. The problem is if we have neurological symptoms, we really wanna avoid giving oral therapy because it's gonna take a lot longer to correct this. So ideally what we wanna do is first correct the initial B12 deficiency with IM therapy. Once we've corrected the levels, then if the patient requires this for life, then we can go ahead and give oral supplementation if they, if they so choose. Now, the other thing to keep in mind, patients who are straight vegans, very strict vegetarians, or those who are on Mediterranean diets are gonna be at most risk for developing B12 deficiency. So it's advised that they take B12 supplementation this is especially true if we have a pregnant patient and or a patient who is planning on breastfeeding after the pregnancy. Because if they lack B12 in their diet, then the baby is not gonna get the proper B12 through the milk and they're gonna be at even higher risk than the mother to develop B12 deficiency. So it's important that they take oral supplementation. Now the elevated levels of LDH, the elevated levels of indirect bile, and the elevated levels of iron are going to start correcting itself within the first few days of therapy. Patients are going to start to feel better within the first few days as well. Now really to correct the hemoglobin, this is going to take on average about 8 to 10 days to really start to notice, but it's going to take up to 2 months to get the anemia back to baseline or to get rid of the anemia I should say. The reticulocyte count is also going to start to increase after a few days of IM therapy. When dealing with the neurological symptoms, the neurological symptoms really start to improve after three months, but it can really take up to one year. Now this is all dependent on how long the patient has been deficient in vitamin B12 and how severe the deficiency was. So like I said, it can take three months to start to notice any change in neurological symptoms, but it can even take up to one year to return back to baseline. The last thing you need to know about this is that these patients are going to be at increased risk for GI malignancy. This means that we have to be really prudent with the screening, like colonoscopy after 50. We should get FOBTs every single year on these patients. And some clinicians even advise doing an initial endoscopy just to make sure that we don't have any early signs of cancer. But this isn't universally accepted. This is not in the guidelines, but it's something to keep in mind that they're at risk for developing GI malignancy. Lastly, like I said, if you misdiagnosis as folate deficiency and you give the patient folate, then their lab values are going to get better and you're going to think you're curing the patient, but the neurological symptoms are only going to get worse because really what's causing the neurological symptoms is a vitamin B12 deficiency and they're going to become more and more deficient without the proper supplementation. So if you're unsure, you're not sure if this is folic acid deficiency, this is vitamin B12 deficiency, then go ahead and give 
both supplementations. This way you cover all the bases. Labs get better, patient feels better, and you know, there's no issue there.